All right, let's jump in and meet our guest speaker, Laura Stasi. Laura is the creator and host of the public radio podcast, Dating While Gray, The Grown-Up's Guide to Love, Sex, and Relationships. And Dating While Gray began as a writing project after Laura's marriage of 30 years ended. She started talking with experts on dating and relationships and with older single and recoupled people. And she learned from them about seeking, finding, and keeping love in later years. Laura is also an award-winning author of several nonfiction books for young readers. She has two grown children and lives in Reston, Virginia, where she's active with the Reston Runners and a board member for its charitable arm, the Reston Runners Community Fund. So Laura Stasi's first season of Dating While Gray began in February 2020, not long before shelter-in-place orders began to change everything. So let's check out the trailer for that first season. I met someone for coffee and he brought water with him. And I said to him, are you going to pay for my coffee? And he said, if I don't pay for your coffee, what's the outcome? I said, we're done. <laughs> Dating does not get easier as you get older. Sorry. My dates haven't met my expectations. <laughs> Let me put it that way. I don't want to date anymore. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> this is Dating While Gray. Because the one thing that doesn't get easier with age is love. I'm Laura Stasi. I was married for almost 30 years before getting divorced. It wasn't my idea. Have you heard the expression, stranger in a strange land? That's how I feel about being single again. And all my friends will tell you, I have a terrible sense of direction. When it comes to gray dating, I really don't know where I'm going. And the more people I talk to, the more I realize I am not alone. A lot of us need advice. We need information. We need inspiration so that we can find that spark, that click, that connection. In the divorce, I asked for joint custody. And frankly, I hope that the sharing would allow us to bridge what was going to be a very difficult time and perhaps come out friends on the other side. If you're serious and you're looking for a serious relationship and the guy isn't mm -hmm. and he runs away, mm -hmm. let him. Ah. The right people will be attracted to you. The wrong people aren't. Do you think it's easier to talk about sex or money? Sex. They both, those are two important things uh, to talk yeah, about. I can tell you right now. But yeah, well, for a man, I know he's <laughs> going to say sex. Since I've been single, I have had sex with approximately... Dating While Gray, coming soon wherever you get your podcasts. Sounds fun, right? It is. And I am excited to tell you that season two just launched last week on WUNC North Carolina Public Radio. So... Laura, congratulations on season two. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I love talking about the podcast and I love talking about the concept of dating in your uh, older years. You mentioned I was married um, for almost 30 years and like many people, I expected I would stay married. And when that didn't happen, um, I was sort of out of sorts for a while because at the same time, my kids were launching. So once the dust settled down, I did decide I wanted to date again, but I had no idea how to do that. So that my um, exploration led to the podcast. That's great. What was it like re-entering the dating pool? It was terrifying. I did not date that much when I was younger. And so, in fact, when I was younger, telephone answering machines hadn't even been invented yet. So I really didn't know how to meet people. And I was hearing about this thing called online dating, which was relatively new. And it, I thought it just sounded terrifying because it seemed like a really loud, really big singles bar, but in someone else's neighborhood. <laughs> so I so I thought surely there are other ways to to meet someone. Um, and so that's what I you know wanted to ch check into. And so um, 
I set up a website and I started interviewing. My first focus was how are people meeting each other? Mm -hmm. And I realized, yes, online dating is popular, but there are many other ways to meet people. And so my first focus was that. But then when I was interviewing couples, I realized there are other issues to consider that it's not just the, the finding of someone. It's how do you make the relationship last? What does the commitment look like? Um, and so that's sort of how it kind of evolved into a podcast with multiple issues. You know, and, and it's not just meeting, you know, stories of people meeting each other. It's it's an issues um, yeah. thing project yeah, as well. It's not just that simple, right? It's not as simple as that one thing. It doesn't, no. Um, so now, some people think it's really hard to find someone. For some people, it has not been hard. I mean, it's just boom, they find someone and that's it. But um, that doesn't mean there aren't necessarily complications involved. Right. right. Okay. So Laura, how deep and how wide is the gray dating pool and who else is out there swimming? Oh, so this is, um, so first of all, the podcast is not just for people who have gone through a gray divorce, but I do want to talk about that for a moment because that's how I entered the, the the scene. And also because gray dating is a phenomenon that's happening all over the world. It used to be that um, a couple got married and once they had sort of hit the 20 year mark, the likelihood of them staying together for the rest of their lives was very high. But in the past, I think starting in the 1990s, the number of couples who have been married 20, 30, and even 40 years who then decide to divorce um, has skyrocketed. Um, and so those people are likely to jump back into the dating pool. I'm sorry, I don't know if you hear, there's um, a plow right in front of my <laughs> my window. We're scraping it. We got a lot of ice. So um, I hope it's not too obnoxious. No, no worries. No worries. Yeah. So um, the Census Bureau does give us an idea of how many older single people there are. Um, 50 and older, and actually, let me say that older unmarried versus married people. So they um, they have something called the annual population survey, and they categorize people as married, which is spouse present or spouse absent, mm -hmm. or unmarried. And the unmarried categories are, let me just check that out. The unmarried categories are never married, separated, divorced, and widowed. So we do know that the number of married people, married Americans, 50 to 84, is 68.2 million people. Mm. And in comparison, the not married categories, again, never married, separated, divorced, and widowed, is 37.9 million people. So there are fewer not marrieds than there are married. Um, one thing we do know for sure is that regardless of marital status, older women outnumber older men. And we also know that the ratio of not married women to not married men, it grows even more lopsided as we age. Um, so that in the two oldest age groups, uh, 75 to 84 and then 85 plus, there are more than twice as many not married women as there are not married men. So one thing that we don't know, though, from a uh, great dating perspective of those not married people, we don't know how many are actually uncoupled. We just know that they're not married. They could be in committed relationships. And it also doesn't tell us if they're looking for opposite sex partners, same sex partners, or they might not even be looking at all. Yeah, so, there's a lot more to it today, right? It's like, it's not, it's not exactly as it was when they set up all these kind of categories in, in the research and the data. Yeah. So we do know that um, older heterosexual women um, might feel discouraged because they look at the statistics and they say, hey, there are so many more of us than there are men statistically. Um, you know, all the good ones are taken. The odds of recoupling are very low. Um, and that's the one thing I do love about the podcast is finding stories that uh, are sort of exceptions to these so-called rules. Yeah. I mean, I've met older men who are dating women even older than they are. I just interviewed a 61 year old man who's dating a 71 year old woman. And his big concern is, I know, don't you love it? I well, love it's it. Interesting because you always think that men go for younger women, right? That's like the, the rule, right? That's the stereotype where they're going to go for someone 20 years younger, but that's not the case, huh? 
It's not necessarily true. Um, yes, there are examples of that, but there are examples of others too. There's also, you know, the stereotype that um, as soon as a, a, a man, if he loses his wife, um, the so-called casserole ladies come calling and a widower gets snapped up really quickly. And that's also not true. Um, I have met, I've met now two men who are actually widowed. Each of them were married, uh, widowed twice. And they stayed, quote unquote, on the market for a few years after recoupling. So, um, and that's another thing. We all expect that women will outlive their male partners. And that's not always the case either. Wow. I know. And there was always that thought too, that like if women aren't married by a certain age, they're never going to get married. Right. right. So how are you seeing that? If we've got all these never married over 50, that's not, you know, they're still out there. Right. Yes. And, and we'll, as I'll show you later, there's an example. I mean, I've met women over 50, women over 60 who are getting married for the first time. Women, uh, men over 60 who are getting married for the first time. So what that tells optimistic me is it's never too late to recouple. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So there's always hope, right? Uh, that's what I'm waiting for the right one. Yeah. So, okay. So we talked a little bit about that. How, let's talk about finding, like how are people in later life meeting? So you talked about like online dating and all that. Everybody knows that that would be the terrifying thing. Like I don't want to get on the app. Right. But how are people in later life then meeting new potential partners and, and kind of finding people? Yeah, so um, I just want to call attention to this slide. I love this in that this woman uh, is, was a dating while gray, is a dating while gray Facebook page follower, and she sent me this picture. This man is her auto mechanic, and she told me that she had been online dating for years and had not met anybody, and then she, you know, was taking her car in to get it fixed. And she mentioned to this very nice man who she had not looked at twice that um, her, it was like a, her, her air conditioning or something that was broken at her house. And he said, oh, I'll come take a look at it for you. And they've been together ever since. Wow. And her point is she has a master's degree. He has a um, trade school diploma. And if she had met him online, she never would have looked at him twice because she thought she wanted to have someone who had the same educational level she had. So online dating is big, but in fact, I had a researcher tell me it's the number one way couples of all ages meet. But when I hear stories like this one and other stories, I, I just have a hard time believing it. <laughs> and I think we just have to keep our eyes open to different possibilities. Um, well, and there's an exception to every rule, like all these rules. And it's like, yeah, but I know someone that's dating their auto mechanic or yeah, I know someone that met someone at the grocery store. So yeah, people are meeting um, serendipitously. Um, I'm also doing an episode I'm calling Boomerang Love. It's about people who, like someone from their past comes back into their life, whether it's an old school classmate or boyfriend or girlfriend or childhood neighbor. Um, I've heard of married couples getting, you know, get divorced and getting back together. So I love just, the idea of a boomerang, Laura. I love that because like, like that's, that's like the most romantic story, right? We've all seen the movies on stuff like that. And it's like, oh, that's so romantic. I love calling that a boomerang. It's like, came back around. Yes, and. Yes, and. So I, I'm, I'm actually, for that episode, interviewing um, a so-called expert. There's like a website that's been set up all about these boomerang romances. And they can be very intense, but also very painful um, for many reasons. Sometimes these relationships occur before other relationships have ended. But because it's an old love, it's just so intense. There's something about the hormones or, you know, the memory that's imprinted on us. So... But yeah, and some people are hiring uh, matchmakers. Some people hire dating coaches. Um, I do have some stories, uh, interesting stories of finding that I particularly like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have those? Do you want to talk about yeah, those? So yeah, you you got one coming up right here. Yes. Let's talk yeah. about Claire and Jim. I'll, I'll tell you all about them first. Um, so Claire and Jim met 
online, as it says, and Jim's been married and divorced and to the same woman twice. So that right there is very interesting. Claire has never been married. She had two longtime loves before she met Jim. She had not had a date in 10 years, 10 years, people. So when you think, okay, if you haven't had a date in 10 years, forget it. It's hopeless. No, it's not. So they live about 60 miles apart. And when they decided they were ready to meet in person, Jim took the lead in making the arrangements and he chose a place that was halfway between their homes. And so he set the date and the place and the time, but he forgot to write down the time. He was relying on his memory. I'm going to remember, I'm going to remember what time I said I'd meet her. So this is, and I'm going to, this, this is what happened. I waited about 45 minutes and then it, it dawned on me, oh, I'm late. And she already came and left. Oh, is that what happened? No, I arrived 15 minutes after he left, oh. being early for the time we're supposed to meet <laughs> in the rain. So I drive back to Maryland and get online and apologize for being late <laughs> when I had left 15 minutes before we were supposed to meet. Her heart was large enough that she gave me another chance to um, meet. Yeah. I put it in my Google calendar and I wrote it down. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's such a meet cute, right? It's like, oh, when we met, we like, I love the meet. Are they still together? Like, did it all work out for them? They're still together. They, um, so uh, that date was in January or they met in December of 2019 and in January 2020 is when they were getting to know each other. And um, so shortly after the pandemic hit, they made a decision. Uh, we think we want, uh, you know, we want to continue and we would like to try being in a committed relationship. So she actually moved in with him for six weeks. They thought, okay, let's just plunge right in and see if we can get along. And they had a lovely six weeks together. At the end of that time, she moved back to her house and he, happily, and he's in his house and they still get together, you know, as often as time permits. Um, one thing I especially like about this story, as we get older, sometimes we get extra sensitive. And if someone is late, we automatically assume, oh, we're being stood up. Yeah. or he doesn't care enough about me that, to be on time. And so I like what he said about her heart was big enough that she gave him a second yeah. chance because it was just totally an innocent mistake on his part. It's so emotional too, right? You remember like when you were dating the first go round, right? Things happen and maybe when we're older, we're easier. It's easier for us to recognize that, you know what, let's find out what happened rather than to your point, just assume the worst. Well, also, we, a lot of us have been, um, even if we're online, we've been, we're so cautious, yeah. justifiably so. But he was a, you know, he was a stranger, basically. She had, she had, you know, talked to him and they talked on the phone and emailed, but she didn't know him. And so, um, yeah, I just, I just love that story. It, you know, it worked out great for them. Yeah, I love that story, too. I love that story, too. Do you, you have another story for us, too, right? I do. And this is from, I actually, this is Patricia and Joe, and um, they are featured in episode one because they met on a virtual speed dating event that got bungled. And if you heard the episode, um, she actually signed off before she was actually put in a room because it, it, it was taking too long, but he noticed her picture. He started writing to her. Uh, she had no idea what he looked like. And then he sent her this terrible picture, but still she decided to give him a chance, and um, I didn't say this in the episode, but she had a psychic, they had psychic dr dreams about each other. And so then, so they spent two months getting to know each other. Do you want to hear the psychic dream, or do we have time I for that? I only want to hear the psychic dream. <laughs> of, course, so, of course we want to hear the psychic dream. Okay. So the speed dating event was in March. In February, individually, they each had a psychic dream and the dream was a couple of days within each other's dreams. And they know this because Patricia was telling Joe, she said her, she had a dream so vivid that she wrote it in a dream journal. And so she was able to pull this. So they're talking about having a virtual date and she's saying, you know, I had a dream and I dreamed that there was a, a black man with long braids. I was at dinner and he was a magician and he was doing magic tricks and then he leaned over to me and said, when you're finished eating, let's go outside and talk. 
And so she told Joe, she said, um, okay, he looked just like you, but I don't understand the magician part. And he said, oh, let me show you. And he took his phone and he showed her his dream journal. And on the top of his dream journal, it was the image of a magician card. And then he showed her a t-shirt and it had a magician. He does tarot card readings and he chose the magician as his card. So she's like, wow. And he said, okay, and now let me show you this. And then he opened his dream journal and showed her his entry, which was a couple of days after her dream. And again, this was before they met in person. Right. He used to be in the military. He was at a ball. And in his dream, he's at a ball with a bunch of men. And they're all waiting, you know, they understand that they're all waiting for their wives to come in. And all of a sudden, this line of women comes marching in. And there's this tall, statuesque blonde, and he recognizes, oh, that's my wife. So isn't that great? So, um, so they, they, they talked for about two months without ever meeting in person. And then once they met in person, boom, that's it. Now they're now engaged. But Joe writes sonnets for Patricia. Oh. And I recorded them reading a sonnet that he wrote. Oh, let's hear that. I love this. First date sonnet for Patricia. Can't stop thinking about you. You never leave my mind. Always wondering how you are and how you spend your time. Can't stop thinking about you. Your presence sweetly stays within a mental garden where my emotion plays. Can't stop thinking about you, how beautiful you are. Praying we find a love so true, it takes us to a star. Waiting, Waiting in, in celestial, celestial blue, blue. So, so near, near it, it can't, can't be, far. be far. First date sonnet for Patricia. That is so romantic. Beautiful. Oh, how beautiful. Yes. And Patricia's, she was her, she's a widow and her um, husband had been a writer. And she showed me, she had these like bound books full of things he had written her. And so the fact that also Joe just happened to be a writer and was, I mean, they just feel like they were, you know, it was just a meant There's to be. No kind of accidents. It's kismet. <laughs> I'm a romantic. I'm allowed to believe in fate and love. Yeah. Yes. I do believe in fate. I totally do. Okay. But timing. Go ahead. I was going to say timing has a lot to do with it too. Right. The boomerang thing, right? Like you never know. <laughs> So we talked about seeking and finding. Let's talk a little bit about keeping. So what are some things, and you mentioned before, like it's a little scary sometimes meeting someone you don't know. So what are some things that older couples should think about, right? What are things that we wouldn't have considered that we should think about when we, when we jump into the, the pool, get back into the great dating pool? So um, we're all coming at this with different life experiences. Even if we've never been married, we've accumulated, you know, at least 50 years worth of living. And um, some people might think it's more difficult at this age to make a life with someone else based on everything we're bringing into the relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are feelings that we have about uh, sexual history, sexual um, intimacy, uh, whether that's important to us or not. Um, and so those are things that couples need to get on the same page with it. You know, it almost doesn't matter what you're, I, mean, I don't know how to say it, what you're interested in, yeah. as long as you both agree, um, you know, or you're both, you know, on the same page as far as sex and sexual intimacy. Um, you know, it's, it in, your, in the preview at the top of it, I thought it was funny that they're like, which is harder, sex or money? And it was like money. Like sometimes like the things that you think are going to be hard, it's like, that's not as tough as maybe money or, you know, it's like, there's all these other factors, right? Well, it's funny because we're doing another episode on money as well, where I talk about, and we're also doing another episode on sex, but I talk about, I find it much easier to talk about sex than money. I don't know why. Maybe I, I don't like I, there's a line I say, you know, if somebody were to say, OK, show me your bank ledger or let me take a peek and see what color underwear you're wearing. I have to think twice. <laughs> I'm sort of joking, sort of. But um, <laughs> money, is, 
Money is such a, I mean, they're both such, they can be such sensitive topics and they don't have to be hard to talk about. But identity is, is in a large part wrapped up in both of those. Um, and in fact, in season two, I talk with a man who is a retired social worker. He is debt free. He owns his own car. He owns his own condo, but he thinks he can't get a second date with women because he wasn't a high earner. And so his belief about himself is coloring his entire dating life. Um, You know, for better or for worse, I just, I would be very sad if that is the case, that the only women he's encountering are women who are interested in him as a source of income. I mean, I just, that just sounds like a stereotype to me, but yeah. Um, so, but, but, but you do, you know, couples and, and speaking of finances, that is some, an issue that people um, really need to talk about. Um, you And I, one of the experts I spoke with talks about money is financial values, not how much you make, but how do you use money? Do you want to use it as a way to take care of people you love? Do you want to, you know, use it as um you know, you want to have a big pot just in case of, you know, medical emergencies or, you know, rainy days. Do you like to travel or do you think it's not worth spending the money on travel? I mean, so that's those are issues confronting couples. And those are important things, right? Because those really, especially older in life, like if you've been saving your money to travel, that's important. And you're going to want to make sure you're with somebody else that values that or you've been saving your whole life towards something they don't value. So I understand that you have to have that shared value so that you guys are on the same page. Yeah. And um, one couple, I, I, the financial advisor that I spoke with in season one, she mentioned one, uh, a couple that she had been advising and one partner wanted to, they didn't have kids. Mm-hmm. Neither one had kids. One partner wanted to uh, set up educational funds for nieces and nephews and the other partner was like, that, why would you do that? They've got parents, you know, let's get jet skis, let's travel. And so that was like a real sticking point in their relationship is trying to, you know, get on the same page. Um, and actually, which brings me up to how do we define commitment in the first place? Yeah. Some couples, it's really important for them to get married. They want the paper, they want, you um, you know, for religious reasons or uh, tradition reasons, they really think it's important to be officially married. Some couples, they don't care about marriage. They just want to know that they're committed to each other. And then there are some couples who get married and don't even live together. They think it's important to get married, but the traditional aspect of taking someone's last name and living in the same place that doesn't happen. Um, well, imagine you've already got your place, right? Like you're older, you've got your life, you've got your place. You don't necessarily need to do that. So while some people may want to, you may not need to. And and how about like adult kids? Like how do they factor into this? I have to imagine your own family and what they think and all that has to come into play, right? Yeah, I mean, it can be very confusing. Um, so you... <laughs> mentioned having your own place. I interviewed uh, Diane Rehm as uh, she hosted a talk show at the NPR member station here in DC for many years. She was widowed um, and she ended up getting married again. Her husband lives in Florida. She lives in Washington, DC. They don't even live, you know, an easy drive away from each other. She wanted to get married because for her, she wanted to show her grandchildren that the the man she was, you know, basically sharing a bed with um, was her husband and not just a boyfriend. That was important to her. Um, but then I met an interesting couple, Jerry and Ann. Do you want to talk about Jerry and Ann for a yeah, moment? Yeah, let's talk about them. Yeah. yeah. So Jerry and Ann, they bust a couple of uh, different myths. Uh, Ann had never been married until she met Jerry and they dated for 10 years. And then they got married um, in their late, she was in her late seventies and Jerry lives in my hometown of Reston, Virginia and lives in Arlington, which is maybe 10 or 12 miles away. Mm -hmm. They have their own place during the week and on the weekends they get together and they also live together in the winter months in Florida. But um, I interviewed Anne and this is what she had to say about being married. Well, all of a sudden at this age, I have two stepchildren 
three step grandchildren. One other thing is that at almost 80, and Jerry's 85, we still have a very active sex life. Jerry loves sex, and he's going through puberty again. He thinks he's 14. We're not dead. We're just old. That's great. That's great. And they, I love and that. Do they, they still live apart, right? Yeah, I have not spoken to them since COVID, so I don't know. Um, it, you know, what they're... Typically in the winter months, they would be together in Florida. Yeah, so, got it. yeah. Um, but the, her, her comment about Jerry acting like, like a 14 year old, that is a sort of a theme I'm hearing from a lot of older daters that they feel young again. I mean, there's something about, I don't know whether it's, uh, hormones, or I have no idea. In fact, I'm actually interviewing a famous brain expert to talk about what happens to the older brain when we do fall in love at this stage of life, because it seems like um, just people feel so youthful. I interviewed a woman, she is a judge. So you think of a judge as very practical, very no nonsense. She was living in Atlanta and she was traveling to Phoenix. This was right before the pandemic. And so she asked, um, she had a friend who had a friend who lived in Phoenix. Yeah. And so she said, well, can I have this man's name? I'll take him out for coffee. Maybe he can make sure I, you know, I'm seeing all the sites. Yeah. And they went out to coffee. Coffee became dinner. They closed the restaurant down. He gave her a ride back to her hotel. They stayed in the car talking for several hours. Wow. And it was just instant. And then, so, you know, long story short, a few months later, she moved from Atlanta to Phoenix and they bought a place together. Wow. And they're now living together. Power of connection, right? Connecting. It's like the, the I love love. We talked about we love love, right? It's like that connection yeah. just yeah. makes you hopeful and, and you feel yeah. exuberant. But she did say um, that her she has two kids and her daughter had a really difficult time with it. Her son was fine. Her son was like, I'm glad you're happy. Um, you know let him know that if he hurts you, you know, I'm going to kick him, you know, but her, her daughter was very upset. She felt almost abandoned and her daughter was, you know, almost 40 years old, but, um, but she's worked through it now and everything's yeah. great. So. That's hard. That's hard, right? I can imagine. So you have adult children who think they get to weigh in now and you want their feelings to not be hurt or them feel abandoned, but yeah. maybe you have a whole, you have a whole lot of life left. So yes, you know, you raise <laughs> That's great. Laura, this is such great content and information, and you have gathered so many lively and touching interviews, and I'm really excited about season two. Uh, you have a trailer you could share with us on season two, right? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Let's play the trailer for season two. What does love even look like at this stage? Because it would be much different. Both people would be set in their ways. Well, what does that look like? I don't know. Dating after age 50? I've had questions, even before the pandemic. And at the end of the evening, she just grabbed me and gave me this impassioned goodnight kiss that just left me feeling like, my God. So when she turned me down for a second date, I, I, I said, look, I know you had a good time last week. You know, you'd look at these pictures of these men you know, looking in the bathroom mirror or holding a fish or whatever, and you go, nope. Don't be so self-conscious because everybody else is in the same boat you are. They're alone. They're stuck at home. This is season two of Dating While Gray, the grown-up's guide to love, sex, and relationships. I'm Laura Stasi. I was married for almost 30 years, and then I got divorced. I've learned how to be great on my own, but I would like to share my life again. And as someone with a terrible sense of direction, I'm really not sure how to get there. So I'm asking for help from dating and relationship experts and from other people who are looking for love or who found it in these later years. I'm sharing everything I learned because one thing I do know, a lot of us need advice. We need motivation. We need inspiration. I passed out. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. This was before you went to bed. Yes, okay. before the sex. COVID is the best and worst thing to ever happen to dating. And um, we are we have yet to see how that 
is going to play out in the long term, but it is still possible for you to find love. You know, we're all sort of starting and I'm 70 and I'm starting, well, I'm trying to start, you know, full speed ahead, let's meet someone, let's fall in love again. Dating While Gray, season two with WUNC, North Carolina Public Radio, coming soon wherever you get your podcasts. That is great. That is great. So for everybody here, I encourage you to listen to season two at WNC or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can like and follow the Dating While Gray Facebook page. Everything's up on the screen right now. And as I said, you're going to get a copy of this. So you don't have to write it down right now. You'll get this. Um, you can also follow Laura on Twitter at Dating While Gray. Right. You can reach out in other ways. And Laura, I believe people can reach out to you with some of their own stories, maybe, right? They could share their stories with you. Maybe they'll get on the next podcast or something. Yes. You know, I love hearing from people. And one thing I I do want to say is if they don't want to use their real name, we will honor their privacy. It's the story is what's important. Not It's not important for people to identify who told the story. And I really love that people are so vulnerable because their story is personal to them, but it's you know, it, it's universal. And I, a lot of the people that write to me say, thank you, please thank, you know, X for telling us his story because I saw myself in that piece. And yeah, I, just, I well, love that. And you think about like when we were younger, we had all our friends around us too. We need the same thing. We need to help each other. Right. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So we already have some great questions coming in Ooh. and we, this is our time to hear from all of you guys that are with us. So we welcome all your questions. So just click the Q&A icon and type your question in the window and then I'll see your question and I'm gonna pose them to Laura, we'll have a response. We're gonna to get to as many as we can. And don't worry, like I said, you're all gonna get a follow-up email with all of this and a recording of the webinar. So you can refer back to it, share it with your friends and loved ones, right? So let's start, we've got some good questions. So here's a good one from Tim, Tim. While our generation was raised on the concept of the man asks a woman on a date, it is 2021, and the rights of equality mean that now women have the same opportunity to experience rejection as men. Isn't that true? So do you find that our generation is more likely to share the burden of asking, or are they still clinging to this responsibility of the men doing it and getting dumped on the men? What do you think? I think it's a really good question. I think it's a good question too. That's why I'm like, we're going yeah. to the and good one. I mean, I have, I mean, I know a lot of women who do not hesitate to ask a man out. And that, that's almost like that's the way the online dating is set up. That if anybody, you know, either the man or the woman is interested, then either one of them can approach the other. I have to tell you, um, some of the old feelings still stick. Like I have heard women who like the men reach out and they start a conversation and then something happens. They don't hear from him or, you know, for a day or so or whatever. And then they think, okay, well, wait a minute. I can't check up to find out what's going on because he reached out first. He's supposed to be more interested than I am. You know, and I just think life is so short. (laughs) If you see somebody that you're interested in, ask them out. Approach them. Yeah, and I'm saying approach them, you know, um, in a safe way with, with these COVID times. Um, also, if some if communication goes blank, I think we're all, oh, you know, we're all allowed to do a one follow up. Hey, just checking in because something could have happened. Um, but then if you don't hear back, then just assume that it, it's just a rude way of, you know, saying that they're not interested. But yeah, I think um, I'm hoping that we can all just be you know, do what we want to do. Yeah, I think so. So, okay. So we have a couple good, these are a couple good questions too. And I was thinking about this earlier dating and safety. And there's one that's like, where's a good place to meet for a first date, but also any thoughts on dating and safety, right? I have friends that have sent me the license plate number of the person they're meeting. My friends do that. They have to take me a picture of the plate so that at least I could tell the police something, but do you have any other ideas on how to be safe when you're dating people and where do you meet them and stuff like that. Yeah. So first of all, I'm assuming we're talking either post COVID or pre COVID because COVID throws a whole new, let's actually talk COVID for a moment. Let's talk COVID. There's another question about that too. 
how do you do this during COVID, right? Yeah. Tips on this. Yeah, let's talk COVID. Um, so if you're online dating, you already know that the, the sites have set up like video aspects so that you can actually see someone if you choose to. So instead of just writing back and forth, emailing or texting or whatever through the site, you can actually get on a video chat with them through the site fairly quickly and know if there's any kind of connection. So a dating coach that I interviewed recommended that people should do video chats right, you know, as soon as possible. Yeah. However, that doesn't mean you then have to almost immediately go into meeting them face to face that it's okay to take your time getting to know someone virtually, whether you are Zooming or doing FaceTime, and you could take that off the, you know, you could continue to do it on the site, but you also, you know, once you feel comfortable, take it off the site, like just do your own, you know, Facebook or texting or whatever. But I have heard of relationships that have actually blossomed during COVID and they, mainly because they took a lot of time getting to know each other. Like Patricia and Joe, they were strangers. They talked for two months before meeting in person. And in many ways, that takes off the pressure of getting sexually intimate too quickly. Yeah. Um, And you want to talk about, okay, do you believe that COVID's a thing? Are you wearing your mask? You know, are you, you know, you want to get on the same page as- Yeah. Break up the relationship at the start. Yeah. So, I mean, um, and also serendipity is happening. Of course, it's trickier. But like I I spoke with a woman who met a man while she was walking her dog. Um, Now, I personally have a dog, but that could never happen because my dog is so protective. Even during non-COVID, she would not let me come near. I mean, a nice looking man looks at me twice and she sometimes lunges. I mean, it's just, we need to teach her about that. But um, yeah, I, I digress. So, um, and even if you do decide to meet, stick with the, it's kind of cold now, but you can meet, you can go for a walk. Yeah. You can, um, you know, one woman who called in and left a message for the Dating While Gray uh phone line she actually the early days of the pandemic they had a tethered six foot rope between them. <laughs> i mean they were following things to the t they were both masked they're you know doing the six feet and they didn't get along but not for other re- you know she, yeah. she said it was like giving up a roll of uh paper towels she felt like you know she needed to make this relationship last but um but so it's a little slower maybe um but also that can lead to more emotionally intense well, it's relationships. You're right, though. When you're when you're talking to somebody and you're doing the video, like maybe you get to a deeper connection, right? Where there's not the physicality right away, and you have to do it that way. So maybe you could spend more time getting to know them. I think that's kind of cool. So yeah. okay, there's a really cool comment here that I have to share with you because we're, you just talked before about you know somebody, you know maybe you're afraid that somebody doesn't want to see you anymore, or whatever. So somebody, Kate is saying, there's a funny story. I read the obituaries to see if someone had ghosted me or had died, and he had died. I oh. Said he to his daughter. So that's terrible. It's like, you know, I think someone ghosted me, and then I saw them in the obituaries. It's like there's there's dark humor in that a little bit. Well, you know, some of us who are parents and kind of um, worried types, I mean, sometimes you think, oh, my gosh, did he die? Because what else, what well, else would explain? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there's a couple questions here too about family and friends right so how do you introduce the new love interest to your family and friends is there a rule that we should follow in terms of timing weeks months whatever right when we're younger you kind of had new a little bit and then also how do you explain to your kids that you're dating again i have a feeling my daughter could take the news like the 40 year old daughter in atlanta so those those are good ones it's like how do you approach that So this, it it really depends, I think, on what, a lot of it depends on what led to you dating in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, So, okay, this is a really, and again, I want to stress, I'm no expert. I'm just relaying information that I've heard from experts and from other daters. And I think, um, I think just the more, as far as letting the kids know you're dating, I think the 
more open you are without giving too many details. I mean, surely they know that you are, you know, an adult. Well, let me, let me back up. A lot of kids, no matter what age, do not want to think of their parents as anything other than their mom or their dad. Right. They don't want to think of you as a sexual being. And so the minute they hear that you're dating, then they start thinking, I mean, they don't even want to hear about you having sex with your, you know, with their, with their parent, yeah. with their mom or dad. Yeah. When you all were married. So right. having sex with someone else, la, 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 la. Um, so I just, I personally feel like I don't want to introduce my kids to someone unless I'm pretty sure that they're going to be around in my life for a period of time that I think we assume that grown kids can kind of roll with the punches when in fact it can be difficult when parents split. And so if you have then a revolving door of boyfriends or girlfriends that you're introducing them to, that can be a little discombobulating for them. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody popped in with, you know, you, I've been using the same rules for introducing a new date to young children, right? You don't do it to even going on for six months. Otherwise you don't introduce them, right? Make sure to your point, make sure there's something there. Yeah. And during the age of COVID, some of the younger kids are probably less uh, careful than we're being. And so you don't know if your partner's kids are being as careful as you want to be. And then if yeah. you're, I mean, it, it just uh, expands the bubble. It changes everything, right? So yeah, yeah. So here's another one. How do you keep hope alive, especially when you've been single for a while? Oh, things like this kind of break my heart because I think it's really, mm, keep hope alive. I just feel, I mean, this sounds so um, Pollyanna. I just feel like it's a mindset. I mean, I don't have anyone special in my life, but I can't, I I suppose it's possible I'll live the rest of my life without someone. I, I suppose that's possible. I choose not to focus on it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I choose not to be desperate about finding someone. And I think if we um, just make sure that we're very fulfilled, and again, all of this, it's so difficult right now in COVID. I mean, all of us are struggling from, you know, to one degree or another. I realized yesterday I drove to the post office and it had been about 10 days since I had been in my car that other than walking my dog or going for a run, I had been in, you know, in this little bubble. And so it can get very discouraging. And you think the way we're living, you know, the way I'm living now, that's the way it's always going to be. But I do think it's really important to just be, have as full of a life as we can have with living alone and with our loved ones. We have loved ones, whether they're friends, kids, siblings, and just be open to the possibility that some, something's going to happen and taking charge too. I mean, when it, getting online, going for, I did a virtual speed dating event. Um, I loved virtual speed dating. I thought it was really fun. So, and that's kind of a safe way because with virtual speed dating, uh, they put you all in a room at the same time. So you can see everybody else who's doing it, which is a very much, it's not a competitive thing. It's like, oh, we are all in this together. That's the way I looked at it. I thought it was great. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because Tim um, piped up on here with the question. It says, why do we burden dating with so much gravity, baggage, and speed that we don't place on finding friends regardless of age. And that's interesting because, you know, the best friendships turn into, into right. love and all of that, which makes your life full and rich. And so, yeah, sometimes maybe we're focusing too much on getting past that. I, I agree. I don't know yeah. your thoughts on that, Laura, but I agree. Yeah. And in fact, um, I met somebody who did a meetup group and now the whole thing about meetup groups, you'll hear, okay, there's, I met a bunch of like women will say, I did this meetup group. Oh boy. I got to know so many great women, but you know, no love, whatever. But those women know people <laughs> and other people know people. And I met a woman who did a, I think it was a bicycling meetup group and she met a man who was very nice, but he was dating somebody mm -hmm. and she kept coming back because she liked the group. Well, guess what? A year and a half later, this man and his girlfriend broke up and their friendship turned into, they've been dating now for about three years. So 
Yeah, I think friends, um, you know, I do think it's funny though, that it seems to me, maybe men are different. I don't think women are very good at um, sharing. <laughs> like all of us have met probably at least, at least two men on a dating site that for whatever reason, nice guys, but they weren't for us. Why don't we kind of pass them down to see, hey, he's not for me, but maybe he would be, you know, be right for you. Yeah, that's right, right. Well, I mean, if we took the friend approach, if we thought about getting to know someone, maybe like, this isn't working out, but I got a friend for you that you'd love. That's interesting. Yeah. And I think there was a Sex in the City episode where somebody threw a party and they all brought their quote unquote rejects. Yes. Yeah. I, vow to, I vow to throw that party when, when it's safe to do so. That's fun. <laughs> so w- one person is asking if you're going to have a segment on your show about the different dating sites and the pros and cons. We're not going to get specific only because it becomes a, um, I personally don't want to plug right. any, any dating. Yeah. I will say I've heard great things and bad things about each site. You know, I've heard of people who love match, for example, I've heard of people who hate match. I mean, each site, whether it's eHarmony, Bumble, you know, people, um, have their, personal views about it, depending on, you know, what happens when they're on there. So it's, I will say this, if people have very strong interests, like if you're a vegetarian and you only want to date vegetarians, they have these niche dating sites. So you could try a site just for vegetarians. Um, Or like uh, if you're into yoga and meditation, there's a site called Meet Mindful. You could go to that site. So if you're you know, instead of the pros and cons, maybe kind of open up your mind to what else you might do other than the big three, our time, eHarmony and match. So, you know, it's interesting. You, you just talked about the speed dating. We talked about a couple, like someone is saying, where do you meet people besides online? Can you give us some more examples of that? And I think that there are a lot of things like that. There are groups or there are things that are outside of that. Are there any other ideas? This person's asking about that. And I think that your point on speed dating is interesting because you go and you kind of do a lot of it and you can kind of, you know, it's, it's not online and it, but it's still quick, right? There's still an immediacy to it, but it's not online. And the other well, the thing, virtual speed right now in COVID, it is online. Yeah, but it's, ver- so I'm, I'm saying as opposed to swipe, 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 right? Like there's an immediacy. <laughs> swipe yes. Up. I mean, there's an immediacy to it that it's like, you're going to see it's, a lot of people. You may no Yeah. So I've heard of uh, church groups, for example, who are doing things, social activities online just to get people and they might not be all, you know, it goes back to the whole meet a friend concept. Like my church is very small, but we've broken out into little neighbor groups of like 10 or 15 and each neighbor group meets once a month and we play a card game or do something like that online. So there are things like that. It just takes a little bit of digging. Someone told me yesterday about something called, um, Oh, I cannot remember, but it was like a, a Christian singles group, but it had like chapters in, uh, you know, across the United States. And so it wasn't affiliated with a specific church, but, um, but you could, you know, do the chapter in your, in your uh, community and, you know, meet people that way. There are things like wine tastings. There's a group that um, I, you know, I'm not plugging the specific group, but a group called professionals in the city. That's where I did the virtual speed dating and they do like wine tastings or let's do this virtual trip to Italy. And so you can sign up for things like that, which, you know, the obvious goal is to meet the love of your life, but it could lead to that. Yeah, that professionals in the city, um, Tim put that in the chat. Yeah. Um, and the convo has been going on in the chat of some of that, which is great. Um, so, and it comes to sites, one person, Cheryl, is saying, I found dating sites to be minefields of fake profiles. I've gone in the rabbit hole, chatted for weeks with someone only to surmise that they're fishing. Any advice on that? So, that, I mean, Believe me, it's very sad. Um, And you hear even now with all the warnings, people are still getting taken and it is discouraging. And it seems like, 
you know, for women, it's always a man who has a job overseas and oops, somebody stole this wallet or there was a fight. You know, someone told me they thought they were talking, they, they legitimately, especially like in the D.C. area, there are a lot of government contractors. And so you can be talking to someone who works for the Secret Service or you can be talking to somebody who works for the FBI. But it seems like they're always uh, have a government contract on a freighter ship and there was a fire and I lost my wallet. <laughs> it's like, oh. wait a minute. Um, so one of the good things about being online during COVID is the virtual, is yeah. the, uh, the video chat thing. You can see whether Susan from Cincinnati is actually Ralph from Detroit, you know, trying to steal your money. Um, I would just say be very, yeah, I think the, and there are actual sites that are just, they were specifically set up for video chats, something called um, video on or video off. I can't remember what it is, but it's sort of like a, uh, a dating service yeah. where you sign up, you tell them, like, let's say it's me. I say, I want to meet men within 20 miles of this area. And then they say, okay, get on your computer at six o'clock on Friday. And then I get on and then they, these men that they found come on one at a time and they come on virtually. And then I can like fuzz them out. <laughs> if I've decided. Even though they're not worth it. So, yeah. Well, and you know, some of it too, I think you, you can give instruction on what kind of people you want to meet or whatever, but then I think about the mechanic, right? Like maybe like serendipity. It's like suddenly, huh? You know, so well, one of the episodes coming up is called Dating Across Differences. And I interview this coach and what she says is, you know, we all set our parameters, right? Some of us said, like, I, I will say I have set up a weird parameter about geography. I don't know why, but it feels like I cannot date someone who lives in a specific number of miles in a compass direction from my house. I don't, you know, it's just a weird thing. I'm I traveling that far for love. <laughs> I'll go, I won't go that far. Here's yeah. That. So, but, so this coach is saying, whatever we decide to step up, stop and think why. Mm. Why is it important that they have a college degree? Or why is it important that they live 20 miles? I mean, especially if the, if the goal is just to get to know people mm. um, and these long distance things, maybe we're at a stage in our lives that if we get to know someone and they live farther away, well, maybe they live in some place that I want to retire. The very first couple I interviewed for Dating While Gray, this woman was 67. She had been married and divorced three times by the time she turned 50. And she said, I'm never getting married again. Then when she was 67, she went on a dating site and she had she lived in nashville and she had a house in florida she went on plenty of fish for florida from whenever she went to her house in florida she met a very nice man they were not a love match but they stayed friends and one fourth of july this woman went had dinner with her friend who brought his friend from Monrovia, from Alabama. These two got together. The man was living in Baton Rouge. He moved from Baton Rouge to Nashville. So you never know. Plus, he was 59 years old. He was younger than she was. Wow. So, yeah. So there's hope. Everybody, there's hope. There's hope. Yes. I know we are out of time. We could talk oh. for another hour, Laura. This is so fun. I, and I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And I want to thank all of you that joined us here. And thank you for your questions. We're going to email you recording and transcript of the webinar so you can view it again. Share it with your family and friends, just like you do your rejected love matches. Share them. Share them. So yes. thank you so much for being here. And please, please join us, everyone, for our next webinar on March 17th. The subject is going to be Aging in the Enneagram with speaker Russ Hudson. You can register right now on brookdale.com slash in the know. And our webinars feature a different subject every month. So please visit brookdale.com slash in the know to learn more. And we do hope you again see you again soon. Thank you for being here, Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope that you all stay safe, happy, and well. Thank you so much.
Take care. Bye.